Greetings, everyone. It's time to begin the Bible study. And let's see, looking at my calendar here, today is the 26th day of the month of March and the 20th day of Adar 2, second day of 26th, 20th day of the second Adar, the leap month this year. So that means we're less than, well, right about uh, three weeks till Passover. So Passover is coming very quickly, almost like it's on cat's feet, <laughs> sneaking up on us quietly. But may God be praised that we were able to keep the Passover again this year and to remember all the wonderful meetings and deep significance of the Passover and to draw close to God once again in observing his annual holy days. So I want to go through some news uh, well I want to go through some news today but before I do I have some a quote I want to give you with a just received this week from uh, Lawrence O'Donnell of MSNBC, a newscaster or commentator. Last week he said on this program, and I want you to mark these words, he said, the book of Revelation is a work of fiction describing how a truly vicious God would bring about the end of the world. No half-smart religious person, he said, actually believes the book of Revelation. They are certain that their God would never turn into a malicious torturer and mass murderer beyond Hitler's wildest dreams. End of quote. So said MSNBC's Lawrence O'Donnell. Well, Lawrence O'Donnell, my friends, is a liar and a spiritual perverted person or the mind of the devil. He says the book of Revelation is a work of fiction. Well, he's going to find out in the next few years that the book of Revelation is spot on biblical revelation and prophecy of a holy God who's angry with this world and its wickedness, its cruelty, its bestiality. It's not God who is vicious, it's the world leaders who are vicious. It's not God who is cruel, but it's the leaders of this world and the wicked who are cruel. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of judgment. He's a God of compassion, but he's also a God of fury for those who will not repent and live right. Those who will not get their house in order and will not love their neighbor and their other people as much as they love themselves. God's way is holy and God's commandments are holy. And God commands us to love one another. And it's obvious to me that this Lawrence O'Donnell does not know God. He doesn't know the meaning of the word judgment. And measured being weighed in the balances and being measured by God. He doesn't understand that God is not just a fluffy idea of a ghost-like, cloud-like deity in the sky, but God is a real entity, a real person. He has character and personality and he's far greater than we can ever begin to comprehend and understand. But he is, he reveals himself in the pages of his word. And in the book of Revelation, he reveals what this world is coming to in this final generation because of the wickedness of man. Not because he is vicious, not because he is a torturer, but man is going to do those things to himself and is doing those things to himself. How close are we now to the end? 
Have we really, <coughs> have we now entered the first stages of the final great tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble? Have world troubles begun to increase exponentially this year? You know, it seems to me, brethren, that this 2011 has become a year of significant changes in the world for the worse. The world is becoming increasingly unstable, fragmented, divided, warlike, and plagues are beginning to descend upon the world greater than ever. So, you know, we look at the timetable of the Bible and there's so many ways we can look at the final days. But one of the key marks to understand Bible prophecy and its fulfillment is the establishment of the state of Israel in the Middle East in the year 1948. Israel became a nation, Mar uh, May 14, 1948 after not being a nation since the days of the Roman Empire when they were sent into captivity and the diaspora. It's almost 2,000 years now. And the Bible says in the last days Judah would once again inhabit the coastlands of Judah in the Middle East. And that's where Israel is today. <coughs> Reestablished. Well, 1948, therefore, <coughs> is a very significant year in terms of the end times. Jesus Christ said in the Mount Olivet Prophecy in Matthew 24 that this generation would not pass before the Son of Man returned. The generation of the end time. A generation in the Bible can be either 40 years or 70 years. In Psalm 90, it speaks of the life of man being 70 years, or a 70-year generation. And if we count 70 years from 1948, we come to the year 2018. 70 years. Or if we count from 1947 when the United Nations decided to establish the state of Israel and divide up the Middle East, it brings us to the year 2017. Now that's very interesting because if we count from 1947 and go 50 years, which is a jubilee period, it brings us to 1967, which was the year of the six-day war when Israel launched forward and conquered the armies and the navies and the air forces of the surrounding Arab nations in the great miraculous war, the six-day war of 1967. Egypt and Syria and, and uh, Jordan and the surrounding Arab nations were all defeated roundly in just six little six short days. And the Jews captured the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights of Syria, the West Bank of the Jordan River, and Eastern Jerusalem, and the Temple Mount. And that was the end of, you might say, the first Jubilee period after 1967. If you go backward from that 1967, backward 50 years of Jubilee, you come to the year 1917. And that was the year General Allenby of the British Army defeated the Turks and recaptured Jerusalem and basically moved the Ottoman Empire out of the middle, out of Israel. And World War I saw the collapse of the Ottoman Empire of Turkey. Palestine became <coughs> the British mandate. So there we have a jubilee cycle from 1917 to 1967. 
then another one from 1967 to 2017. And the question is, in my mind, will Christ possibly return on the Jubilee year of that Jubilee cycle in 1917? or 1917-1918, the beginning or the end of that cycle? Well, I don't claim to know all the answers, but I think it is very, very possible that we've just begun the final countdown to the coming of the Messiah. I don't think we have very many more years left. This past January, I became I entered my 70th year, that is, I'm 70 years old, 7 0, and 7, <laughs> uh, you know, in other words, that's the number of a generation, and maybe now I'm on overtime. The average lifespan of men today in the United States, I just read, is 76 years. I think it said 76 years. Well, of course, some people live beyond that. The lady downstairs, that thing, McBride, she's now 96 years old. Just had a birthday just this past week. But we we are the generation living in that generation that began with the rebu rebuilding of Jerusalem and the establishment of the state of Israel in, in uh, 1947, 1948. This is that generation that Christ was speaking of. Let's, let's read that in the book of Matthew. In the Mount Olivet Prophecy in Matthew 24. It's amazing to me how many ministers and teachers totally ignore these prophecies but yet they are written for us today. And the Messiah said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 32, Now learn this parable of the fig tree. And the fig tree is a type of Israel. When its branches already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near, that is, the coming of the Messiah is near, even at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation, the generation that sees these things come to pass, the generation that sees Israel reestablished in the Middle East, the fig tree, when you see these things, he says, no, it is near, even at the doors, the coming of the Messiah, and he says, just surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away or be completed until all these things take place. And all these things leads up to and means the coming of the Messiah as the ultimate event. So if we count a generation, 70 years from 1947, 1948, it brings us to 2017, 2018. And Christ said this generation would not pass until these prophecies are fulfilled, leading up to and including the coming of the Messiah. Well, if that is the case, and I believe it is, then where are we today? Well, <laughs> <coughs> in Daniel chapter 9 Daniel chapter 9 we read about the famous 70 weeks prophecy or 70 Shavuot and it says in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon your people, that is Israel, and for your holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, 
to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up and finish, conclude the vision and the prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Now, 70 weeks in the Hebrew, the word for weeks is, is Shavuah. Uh, week is Shavuah, and weeks, the plural, is Shavuot. Now, Shavuot's also the meaning of, the name of, the Feast of Shavuot, which is the Feast of Pentecost. Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks. Now, the, the Shavuot is an annual holy day. So if we take this prophecy in terms of 70 Shavuot, or 70 days of Pentecost, 70 festivals of Shavuot being determined for the people and for the holy city to finish the transgression, to make the reconciliation for iniquity to bring in the kingdom of God and to seal up the vision and the prophecy, then what do we have? Seventy years then. From the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem <coughs> <coughs> or let us say from the going forth of the United Nations mandate to establish the nation of Israel in the Middle East for the Jews to return to Israel and to set up and restore Jerusalem and the land of Israel. That was 1947 and they became a nation in 1948. So if we count, therefore, it says, No one understand that from that date until Messiah the Prince, verse 25, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks, and the street shall be built again in the wall even in troublous times. That's sixty-two weeks out of the seventy. But till the coming of the Messiah were to be the final coming there to fulfill and bring in righteousness and the kingdom of God was 70 weeks. And 70, 70 years, 70 Shabbat from 1947 brings us to 2017. In 62 weeks, or 62 Shabbat or years, brings us to the year 2010. Now, 2010 is the year when Barack Obama began to turn away from the state of Israel to bring in his Muslim friends and the Muslim influences into the White House, even hiring Muslims in high positions in homeland security, and beginning to, to endanger and threaten the state of Israel to force them and compel them to accept the existence of a terrorist-ridden Palestinian state on their border, both in the Gaza Strip area and the west bank of the Jordan River. Well, this, here again then, there are the 62 weeks, brings us to 2010, then the final week of years, there's six, or rather 62 weeks, that's, that's 60, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks it says. Seven Shavuot, the seven Shavuot or seven years, and that refers to the final years from 2011 then to 2017. In other words, the final week of Daniel's prophecy. Now we could look at this even further at the very end of this chapter. In verse 27, it speaks of this end time leader of the world or tyrant who's going to rule the world in the end time, called the Beast or the Antichrist, the great world leader that the world's going to worship and adore, 
It says, he will confirm a covenant that is a treaty, an agreement with many, many peoples or many nations for one week or one Shavuot. One week of years is seven years. But in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. Or after three and a half years. Well, they were trying to finish up this covenant with the Palestinians this very year to establish a Palestinian state. We're being told that the world is going to acknowledge and the United Nations will acknowledge and America will acknowledge the state of Palestine and Israel this coming fall as a fait accompli. And they will very likely be admitted into the United Nations. This is talking about being confirmed then for one week or seven years, the final week of Daniel's prophecy, leading up to 2017, the coming of the Messiah. And in the middle of this week, of this period, there will be an end of sacrifice and offering at the temple of God, and on the wing of abominations one shall stand who makes desolate the people of God and the temple of God even until the consummation which is determined which shall be poured out on the desolator the original says the one who makes desolate or the destroyer the one in Revelation who is called Abaddon in the Hebrew language and Apollyon in the Greek language the one who is the great destroyer of the end time who's going to destroy nations he is spoken of also in in the book of Habakkuk if you want to take a look down to Habakkuk chapter 1 the prophecy of Habakkuk the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw he says, O Lord, Yahweh, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. In other words, I don't know if you've noticed it, brethren, but the, the temper of the world and the tone of the world is becoming increasingly violent in society and the movies and television and nations and all around us, violence is increasing. People wonder, why is it happening? Some wonder, why doesn't God stop it? But it's got to run its course. The times have to be fulfilled. Mankind has to learn his lesson of submission to God and obedience to keeping God's commandments or the alternative is death, to die. You know, a lot of people don't understand that. They think, well... I'm free to live as I please and do as I please. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a free-thinking individual and I'll live the way I want to live according to my own standards and dictates. And God says, well, yeah, you can do that. You can do that, but, he says, listen, I set before you the way of life and the way of death, the way of blessing and the way of cursing. Choose life that you may live and be blessed. But you, you can make up your own mind. You can go your own way. But that's the way of cursings, destruction, violence, and death. This is make, you know, you're free to choose, but you can't go your way and have happiness and blessings in life. In order to receive blessings and the abundant life and God's blessings, we must obey God, live His way, and worship Him. That's the lesson of the Passover. That's the lesson of what it means to come out of Egypt, or in our generation, come out, come out of Babylon, come out of religious confusion and ignorance. Turn back to the Lord 
and become enlightened. Christ said that he's the light of the world. He came to bring us light, understanding, truth. And the world rejects it, so the world has a date with death and destruction and darkness. And well, back it goes on here and says to God, Why do you show me iniquity, sin, transgression, and cause me to see trouble, toil, troubles everywhere today? For plundering and violence are before me, and there's strife and contention everywhere. And therefore the law is powerless, and justice never goes forth, not in the world today it doesn't. For the wicked surround the righteous, therefore perverse judgment proceeds. You know, President Obama has endorsed homosexuality and sexual perversion, and now we have the United Nations, the United States is pushing for homosexuality to be recognized and endorsed by the United Nations. Why is that? One might wonder if he's a homosexual himself, or at least a bisexual. Well, according to a recent uh, newspaper I read, one of his homosexual lovers in the past has been threatening to commit suicide. Larry Sinclair. And he insists that he had a relationship with President Obama back when he was a, a young fellow in Chicago where he, where he got started in politics as a party boy. Well, Larry Sinclair has written a book about it, and you can read it. I have read it, and it's very believable, very, very believable book. Well, Habakkuk says, there's strife and contention everywhere. The law is powerless. Justice never goes forth. The wicked surround the righteous. They're all around us. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds from the courts. We have a judge now in Florida who wants to judge a case according to Sharia law, Muslim law, not American law, not legal American jurisprudence or common law, but Muslim law, Sharia law. And he is an American judge. Well, Habakkuk goes on. God says to him, God Almighty answers, <coughs> answers his prophet Habakkuk, and says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. For indeed I'm raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation, which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. He's raising up a nation, or actually, as this is talking about the end time, it's talking about the New World Order, modern-day Babylon, which, which includes Europe and America, North America and Europe, as the basis of the New World Order, or end time Babylon. <coughs> They all come for violence, it says in verse 9. The faces are set like the east wind and gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings and princes are scorned. And in chapter 2 of the book of Habakkuk, the prophet says, I'll stand my watch. I will set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me, to see what's coming and to what I will answer when I am corrected. And then the eternal Yahweh answered me and said, Write the vision. Write it down. Make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. 
this isn't just something to read like a story or a fairy tale or a good night story to go to sleep on. This is something we're to read and heed and take action that we may save our lives. He says, for yet the vision is yet for an, an appointed time. And brethren, I think we're entering right now that appointed time. I think we're at the very threshold, the very beginning of the end time great tribulation, the 70th week of Daniel. And it'll get progressively harder and harder and more terrifying and more intensifying as the, as the final years roll by like a scroll. But it's begun this year with birds and fish dying around the world in the month of January and still today. And with the revolution in Egypt and the Middle East and the war today in Libya and with the great earthquake, 9.0 earthquake off the coast of Japan and the tsunami leading to the worst financial disaster in the history of mankind, over 250 million, bi uh, sorry, 250 billion dollars of damages. 250 billion. And Japan is a leading cosmopolitan industrial nation in the world today and now it's there are going to be a lot of shortages at the markets in America including cars and maybe even computers they make a lot of computer chips in Japan now there's going to be a, a drought of some of the produce because Japan is now basically teetering on the ropes They've got a lot of digging out to do to replace the damages that caused by this tsunami and earthquake generated disaster that leveled thousands of homes and left about a half a million people homeless. 27,000 they're saying now were killed in the earthquake and the tsunami. It was certainly a disaster scene from a movie with trains being flooded by this giant tidal wave. Some are now saying it was 70 feet high in places. Knocked trains off their tracks. Wow. I can hardly imagine. Well, God says, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run and escape who reads it and takes heed to it. For the vision is for the appointed time. But at the end, the very end, it will speak. It will begin to be shouted aloud. And it will not lie. Though it tarries, though it waits a little, wait for it. Because it will surely come. It will not tarry. The time has come. The appointed time. In the book of Daniel, I'm not Daniel, but Jeremiah tells us about this time. In Jeremiah chapter 30, he, the Lord says, Behold, write in a book for yourself and all the words that I have spoken to you, verse 2. For behold, the days are coming, says the Eternal, Yahweh, that I will bring back the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah. And I cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. Well, that's why the Jews are back in Israel today. They're possessing the land, in part, that God gave to their fathers. Now these are the words that the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. Jeremiah writes, but thus says the Eternal, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear and not of peace. Ask now and see if a man is ever in labor with a child. 
so then why do I see every man with his hands on his loins as if he were a woman giving birth and labor and why are all faces turned pale alas he says for that day is great so that none is like it neither before nor any other day to come it is the time of Jacob's trouble tribulation but he shall be saved out of it by passing through it, but God will save him through it. You know, this is talking about the time staring us in the face today. Brethren, in Daniel chapter 9, I'm not chapter 9, but Daniel chapter 12. God tells Daniel at this very end time, same time spoken of by Jeremiah. He says in verse 1, At that time Michael will stand up, the great prince, who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, a time of tribulation, such as never was since there was a nation to even to that time, and at that time your people shall be delivered, just like Jeremiah said. Everyone who's found written in the book. We're entering that time of trouble right now. It has come upon the world in a frenzy. I'm going to give you a lot of the facts a little later during this message today. In verse 4, God tells Daniel, shut up the book words, or seal the book, he says, I'm giving you until the time of the end, or the end times, or the last days. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. <clears throat> and then he said to Daniel, Go your way, verse 9, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed until the time of the end, the end days. Many shall be purified and made white and refined, but the wicked shall continue to do wickedly. They're not going to change. Their hearts are hardened, and they're stubborn and rebellious, and therefore none of the wicked are going to understand or get it get the point but the wise shall understand who are the wise the wise are those who fear God and keep his commandments the wise are those who do not mock at prophecy or, che or jeer at the word of God or scoff or call the book of Revelation myth those people will never understand but the wise are those who fear God and keep his commandments. In the book of Job, Job chapter 28, verse 28, Job says, Behold the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to, to depart from evil, wickedness, lawlessness, is understanding. If you want to understand things, if you want wisdom, to understand the future, you must fear the Lord. Standing in awe of God and His Word, leads to wisdom and departing from evil obeying God's commandments leads to understanding people today are divided up they don't even agree on what the commandments of God are and which commandments were to obey well <coughs> I think I can make that simple for you brethren we are to obey all of God's commandments that pertain to us. 
any commandment God gives, we're to obey. In principle, we're to keep the commandments. Live by every word of God, Christ said. He taught the Torah. He didn't talk, teach against it. You know, it says, he said in, to his own disciples in Matthew chapter 5, Think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets or to destroy or annul the Torah, the commandments. I came not to destroy but to fulfill, to accomplish, to observe and keep, and to teach, to fill them up to the brim, to, to interpret and explain, expound and magnify the laws of God. Not to do away with them. Not to nail them to the cross. He came to show us how beautiful they are. And that we should keep them in order to re receive life. They're life-giving statutes. Well, a third place where this same type of language is used about the day that we're facing today is in the Mount Olivet Prophecy, Matthew chapter 24. And here the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, the Logos, the Word of God, the Word of the Lord, Yeshua, the Messiah, says to his disciples, especially those living in the end of time, the end of days, our day to day, verse 12 he says and because lawlessness will abound all around the world the love of many of people will begin to wax cold to grow cold but the man who a woman that endures to the end endures shall be saved and this good news of the gospel shall be pre of the kingdom of God shall be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, he says, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place in Israel, in Jerusalem, at the Temple Mount, whoever reads, let him understand, he says, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And then verse 20 he says, And pray that your flight be not on, in the winter or on the Sabbath day. So you can actually get out of Dodge and flee. For there will be great tribulation, a time of great trouble, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be in the again in the future after this time. And unless those days were shortened, cut short, no flesh would be saved. Nobody would live. There would be total annihilation on the earth, unless God cut short these days. But for the elect's sake, the chosen one's sake, those days will be cut short. That's what we're facing today brethren the great time of great troubles and disasters and perplexities in the earth in Luke chapter 21 Luke tells us from the same prophecy of the Mount Olivet prophecy In verse 20, he says, well, we're going back to verse 19. He says, in your patience, or by your patience, possess your souls. The way to endure the days ahead of us is we must learn patience. <laughs> the buzzers, a reminder that we're to learn patience. That's one of the hardest lessons I find for people to learn. They want everything, they want it now. We're so used to having instant coffee, instant 
pudding, in instant macaroni and cheese, microwavable food. You go into a, a, a McDonald's or some place and get our hamburger right then and there. Everything's all ready and waiting. Instant food, instant service. We, we're used to getting everything now. Just put a, a dollar in the machine. It used to be a quarter or 50 cents. Now put a dollar in a machine, you get a bottle of pop or a can of soda pop. Then we have auto mats for instant washing of clothes. Just, just put in your money and takes care of itself. Well, he says, in your patience, possess you your souls. We need to learn patience and keep our eyes open and look for the coming of the Lord. But he says, when you see Jerusalem compassed or surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. Now, Israel today in Jerusalem are surrounded by Arab nations who hate the Jews. Now right now they're not all gathered together to wage war, but they're going to be soon. They hate the Jews, they want to stamp them out and drive them into the Mediterranean Sea to wipe out Israel as a nation. Ahmadinejad of Iran, Assad of Syria, Muslim Brotherhood, Al-Qaeda, the fanatical Wahhabi Arabs all want to destroy Israel. That's one thing they're all united on. And they're going to come against Israel by armies. And he says, the Noah's desolation is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and those who are in the midst of her depart. And get out of Dodge. For these are the days of vengeance, he says, verse 22, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. The days of vengeance are upon us, brethren. They're, these are the days of the great tribulation, the days of Daniel's 70th week, the final seven years of this age appear to be upon us now. I know people say, oh, it might be 50 years or 100 years. We can't know. Well, they don't know because they're not obedient to God. They don't keep His commandments. They're not... They don't fear the Lord, so they don't have any wisdom or any understanding. They don't pay attention to the Word of God. It's, he says, this desolation is near. These are the days of vengeance. But all things which are written may be fulfilled, fulfilling the prophecy of Daniel's 70, 70 weeks in Daniel chapter 9, and the coming of the kingdom of God and the return of the Messiah. He says, But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress, tribulation in the land and wrath upon this people. Wrath of the angry, Gentile, furious nations of the world against the people of God. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. In Jerusalem we trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs, he says, in the sun great signs are beginning to occur in the sun even this year we've had a giant solar flare and many more are predicted for 2011 2012 and 2013 great coronal storms on the sun which will knock out satellites on the earth and destroy communications it may drive us back to like a dark age for communications and knock out electronic machines. Signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars. And on the earth, the stress of nations, tribulation among nations, with perplexity, not knowing what's happening, with dazed expression in their faces, with the sea and the waves roaring. That's what came upon Japan, a tsunami 
As they, as well, some reports said some of those tsunami waves were 70 feet high. Went miles inland on the coast of Japan. The orbit of the Earth today was shortened, and the Earth's orbit was slightly changed. The seas and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the Earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they'll see the Son of Man coming and a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to happen, he says, and that, brethren, that's what I'm saying, they are now beginning to happen. They are beginning to happen. And he says, when they begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. Your redemption, the day of Christ's salvation, draws near. Then he spoke to them a parable. Look at the fig tree, he said, and all the trees. Fig tree, again, remember, represents Israel. When they are already budding, he says, you see and know for yourselves that summer is now near. So also, he says, when you see these things happening, know that the kingdom of God is near. Surely I say to you, this generation, the generation that sees these things from the establishment of Israel in the Middle East and Jerusalem, this generation will by no means pass away till all things take place, till the end comes and the Messiah returns. And then he says, heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. His words are going to be fulfilled to the very letter. But take heed to yourselves, he says. Watch your hearts. Lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, dissipation, drunkenness, cares of this life, anxieties of life. And so that day that's prophesied comes upon you unexpectedly because it will come like a snare, a trap on everyone that dwells on the face of the earth. So he says, watch therefore and pray continually, consistently, always, daily, that you may be one of those counted worthy to escape these things and to survive all these things that are going to come to pass upon this earth, these tribulation and turmoil and toil and trouble, to survive, to escape, and to stand before the Son of Man when he comes. It has begun. The, the plague has begun. As we read in the book of Exodus, I think it is, or, or Leviticus, Numbers, the Torah, when Israel sinned against God and the plague began to smite them down after they broke, after they made the golden idol the book of Exodus, and the plague began to smite them down. Well, the plagues of the end times have begun. We saw that actually last year with the BP oil disaster in the Caribbean Sea, polluting the entire ocean of that area. Then the birds and the fish dying early this year, and now the tsunami in Japan and the radiation leaks from the nuclear power plants and now the ferment and turmoil and revolution in the Middle East Libya, Egypt, Yemen now Syria is putting down revolts 
seems like the whole world has gone on a crazy kamikaze ride or a, a crazy wild ride of disaster. Art I'm looking at here says Japan quake leaves 22,000 dead and missing. The country's worst disaster since World War II in Japan. One of the leading nations of the world today. Then another article talks about how the war against the Libyans is becoming fractured as the allies of Europe, America, Germany, Britain, and France are beginning to criticize one another and Obama doesn't want to be the leader in the war and is kind of falling apart. What's the result going to be? Well, if Gaddafi goes, some of them are, some of them are saying, now his son has already been killed, and, and uh, some are saying we should target Gaddafi, the British, but the Americans are saying, no, we don't want to do that. That's beyond our goal, so we're divided. And if we do get rid of Gaddafi, then the question is, if we don't, he's going to launch terrorist attacks against America. If we do get rid of him, then uh, who's going to replace him? Probably the Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood. They, they're they very active in Libya and uh, they're ready to enter the picture and possibly take over. They're distributed throughout the Middle East and also in Egypt. Another article I have here says the United States is just five days away from crisis. From the Wall Street Journal. By day five of the earthquake, a tsunami, meltdown, disaster in Japan, significant parts of Japan are beginning to experience shortages of food, fuel, and water. The article says this isn't Chile or China or even Haiti. We're talking about one of the world's most advanced economies with perhaps the best distribution networks in existence. The disaster underscores the dire circumstances every Westerner could find themselves in, with even a minor sustained disruption of food, gas, or water supply. Simply put, almost no one living in the United States or Europe today is at all prepared for more than a few days of slowed or halted supply of, sh of staples. That's the nature of the modern consumer-based distribution system we have in place today. The author says, as I've pointed out many times, over 40 million Americans currently live on food stamps. That's, that's over 10% of our population. They already can't afford to feed themselves. He says, so what happens if food outlets Stop accepting food stamps and instead demand ever higher amounts of cash for their goods. It seems as though, he says, every week another normalcy bias is shattered by some new and terrible news. I don't think many people expect the dollar to lose its reserve status anytime soon but we're really just one somewhat minor civil war, disaster, or unpredictable chain of events away from seeing the dollar dethroned. So he says it's time for us to start saving money and prepare for the hard times coming get out of debt. And 
of the fact that we're living perhaps at the very beginning of Daniel's 70th week and the time of great tribulation is underscored and highlighted by some remarks made by Israeli foreign minister or defense minister rather Ehud Barak who says Israel is now facing a regional earthquake and diplomatic tsunami speaking at a New York event Defense Minister Barak says Israel has proven that it is a, an island of stability, an outpost of the free world, in a tough neighborhood in the Middle East. Israel, he says, is facing an earthquake, rattling Middle East regimes, as well as the threat of an anti Israeli diplomatic tsunami. Barak said that 2011 has proven faithful for Israel as it faces on the one hand a historic earthquake in the Middle East that regime changes on the other hand a diplomatic tsunami that is rising up against Israel around the world said Barak it will culminate in September this year with the intended recognition of the Palestinian state along the 1967 lines followed by a wide effort aimed to legitimate at delegitimization of Israel referring to these threats that he says Israel is facing Barak cited Hamas in Gaza the Hezbollah in Lebanon adding that in the background Iran still presents a major threat to world order. Did you notice that he's pointing to September of this year, 2000, September 2011? That's about six months from now, actually a little over six months from now. And another article says United States demanding gay rights support at United Nations body the Associated Press March 22nd the Obama administration will introduce its first statement calling for the United Nations top human rights body to combat discrimination against gays and lesbians around the world completing a U.S. reversal from years of ambiguity on the subject during President George W. Bush's administration. The U.S. declaration will be made Tuesday at the Geneva-based Human Rights Council and has the support of more than 80 countries. So there we are calling for nations to end any criminal discriminations or punishments against lesbians, gays, and bisexuals. The U.S. is asking the global body to review how governments treat them in the U.N.'s human rights assessments. The, the U.S. document acknowledges that these are sensitive issues for many. The people must be free from discrimination. That's what they're saying. So, go ahead and disobey God and break God's laws and there'll be no discrimination. That's not what God says. We disobey Him and we invite His wrath and His fury. The book of Revelation shows God's wrath being poured out because of man's sins, rebellion. And acts of wickedness and perversion. And we need to get our eyes on the real picture, the big picture, and see why God is angry with America and the world today and our leadership, which is leading us down the road of destruction. The article says Mr. Obama has stepped up the case for gay rights 
in recent months, winning a congressional vote to repeal the Don't Ask, Don't Tell ban on gays serving openly in the U.S. military. So now they can serve openly and flaunt their gay perversity and abominations. And I saw a video this past week of a school district explaining to teachers how they're going to implement the new sex education laws and guidelines in young grade schools because they're going to start teaching children that it's fine, it's okay to be lesbian or homosexual. They're just alternate forms of lifestyles and it's all perfectly okay. They're going to tell little boys and little girls in the classroom which will encourage this kind of diabolical, satanic behavior. And the teachers will have to teach it. They have to teach you to be kicked off the out of the schools, lose their jobs if they don't teach the new endorsement of homosexuality in the classroom, in their classes regarding social interaction. Saw that video, it made me want to puke, throw up. Now here's some more highlights of trends and prophecy that we're facing today to just give us a, a, an idea, a, a glimpse, for have a, a feeling for just how awesome the days are that we're entering, how different it is from just five years ago. You know, it seemed like five, ten years ago, well, we had lots of time left, comparatively. But now it seems to me we look at the facts on the ground and what's happening around us, it seems like we have very little time left. That the, the Hun is at the gates, as they said during World War I. The war is about to start. The tribulation is rolling toward us. In another article in Prophetic Trends and Headline News, it tells us that today 75% of religious persecution in the world is against Christians. Christians are the ones being targeted today around the world. Meanwhile, Indonesia has raised the alert level at one of its most active volcanoes to the highest level. Another article says the Oregon coast must prepare to repeat the great Cascadia earthquake of the 1700s. This spring, large portions of the United States could be in trouble with spring flooding. The World Bank estimates the cost for J the Japanese earthquake could reach $235 billion. And the question is now being discussed, are mega cities like Tokyo able to cope with large disasters? Meanwhile, fears of the big earthquake in California are prompting people to stock up on emergency survival supplies. Another article is Japan Tsunami Top 70 Feet. The death toll is now set at 27,000 people. 
coming this September, another sign pointing to September 5, the comet LNM appears to be headed our way and will pass within the Earth's orbit, September 5. Signs in the moon, the sun, the moon, and in the stars. This September, the comet LNM will be passing through the Earth's orbit around the sun. And this final article says 15 indications that bad times are about to hit the U.S. economy. 15 indications that the economic malaise striking our country is not yet over. The article says the year 2011 is shaping up to be a really bad year for the U.S. economy. There are all kinds of indications that big trouble is ahead. So far, financial markets are weathering all of the chaos around the world fairly well. But just as there were huge flashing warning signs before the 2008 financial crisis, there are also huge flashing warning signs now. The price of oil is soaring. The U.S. housing market is experiencing huge problems. The cost of living in America recently hit a new record high. And each week the globe around us, the world, seems to be becoming even more unstable. How much more pounding can our fragile economic system take before it completely collapses? The writer asks. And then he says the truth is the financial system was never fixed after the crash of 2008. If anything, it's more vulnerable today than it was back then. Even as you read this, major imbalances are building up in the global financial system. At some point, the tipping point will be reached. What are the 15 signs that we're coming to a gigantic crisis in America and the world? Because what affects America will affect the whole world. Number one, the price of gasoline is about to cross the psychologically important $4 a gallon marker. Number two, the price of oil moved up close to the $105 a barrel mark. Number three, in February this year, food prices in the United States rose the fastest rate in 36 years. Number four, according to the U.S. Labor Department, the cost of living in the United States hit a brand new all-time record in the month of February. Number five, according to the National Association of Realtors, sales of previously existing homes in the United States dropped a stunning 9.6% in February. The median home price now is the lowest it's been in nine years in America. Number six. The United States is already in the midst of a real estate crash that never seems to end. But many are warning that it is about to get even worse. For example, prominent housing analyst 
Gary Schilling is warning that the U.S. housing prices are likely to drop another 20%. Number seven. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, at least 8 million Americans are at least one month behind on their mortgage payments at this point. Number eight. The number of new building permits declined 20.5% in February on a year-over-year -year basis. This huge decline in building permits is usually an indication that a recession is coming, a deepening recession. In fact, he says all nine recessions since 1959 have seen a year-over-year -year decline in building permits. In eight of the last nine, the annual rate of change hit negative 20 percent or lower and the economy then went into a recession. Number nine factor, 31 percent of homeowners have responded to a recent Rasmussen report survey indicated they are quote underwater unquote on their mortgages. Underwater means they owe more money than their house is presently worth. Number ten, Millions of Americans are drowning in debt. And debt collectors are becoming increasingly aggressive. Number 11. Meredith Whitney is warning that even though it may take longer than she originally projected, we are still going to see a wave of municipal bond defaults worth hundreds of billions of dollars bond defaults. Number 12. The war in Libya is putting upward pressure on the price of oil. Another drain on the U.S. government finances and raising tensions across the globe. Vladimir Putin has called the NATO operation in Libya a modern crusade. China is calling for an immediate ceasefire. Financial markets do not like instability of this nature. Number 13. The rest of the Middle East is melting down as well. More than 40 demonstrators have been killed in Yemen and the president of that country has declared a state of emergency. Government buildings are still being set on fire in Egypt. The Ivory Coast is in the midst of a full-blown revolution. And there are ongoing protests in about a dozen other nations across North Africa and the Middle East. This is really bad for global stability. Number 14. The damage from the tsunami in Japan continues to affect more American workers. GM has just announced they are going to temporarily lay off workers at its Buffalo engine plant due to a shortage of parts from Japan. When supply chains will get back to normal is anybody's guess. GM has also temporarily shut down a facility in Shreveport, Louisiana due to supply problems. Number 15. There continue to be indications that the amount of radiation being released in the damaged Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plants is much higher than we've been led to believe. This is an excerpt from a recent report by NHK World. Japan science ministry say radiation exceeding 400 times the normal level was detected in soil about 40 kilometers from the troubled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant.
Professor Kaigo Endo says radiation released by the iodine is 430 times the level normally detected in soil in Japan, and that released by the cesium is 47 times the norm. 400 times the normal level of radiation, 40 kilometers from the plant? That is something that should be taken very seriously, the writer says. So what should we be doing about this, brethren? We stand on the threshold of the Great Tribulation. The article says, so what should Americans be doing? How can middle class families weather the storm that is coming in the world? Well, one thing that can be done, he says, is start saving money and not spending it on frivolous things like new cars and international vacations. Many Americans did not learn the lessons of 2008 and they are running around blowing money as if the good times will never come to an end. Well, they are going to come to an end very abruptly. And he says, now is a good time to get out of debt. Millions of Americans and families are literally drowning in debt. And when the next financial crisis or crash comes, it is families that are overextended that will be the most financially vulnerable. When you see a storm coming, he says, the prudent thing to do is to make preparations. Are we prudent? Are we preparing for the storm? Let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. God says in verse 25, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. The way that seems right ends in death. And then chapter 19, Of the book of Proverbs. The prudent man looks well to his going. That is chapter 19, but uh, I don't know. I lost. I haven't looked that up in so long. I guess I, I can't find it. But verse 16 of chapter 19 says, He that keeps the commandments keeps or guards or protects his soul. But he who is careless of his ways or reckless of his ways will die. Proverbs 19 verse 16. And here's the one I was looking for, chapter 22 of Proverbs, in verse 3. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, protects himself from the evil. But the simple-minded simpleton passes on, just goes on recklessly, lackadaisically, 
and are punished, Solomon said. And also, chapter 27, and verse 12, Solomon again wrote, A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple-minded pass on, just go merrily on their way, and are punished. They, they suffer. We're now headed into the time of great tribulation. We are heading into it. It's beginning. It's beginning all around us. We are in the foothills, the threshold. We've crossed over into the desert, you might say. Do we have plenty of water? Have we stocked up on food? Are we ready for the journey? Are we prepared? Or are we taking unnecessary chances and risks? What would you do if the food, if the Walmart went out of business? What would you do if there's no food supplies on Walmart or Safeway at the major food stores? Do you have food on hand? In Proverbs chapter 28, verse 12, Solomon says, When the righteous, rejo when the righteous rejoice, there's great glory. But when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. The margin says, literally, will be searched for. In other words, they'll, they'll go into hiding. They'll get off the radar. So that the wicked can't take all they have. But put them in prison or destroy them. And we're living in an age now where the wicked <coughs> are rising up all around us. Which is another sign that the end is close. It's here, but the final end is not yet. And then verse 19 of Proverbs 29 tells us, He that tills his own land will have plenty of bread, but he who follows frivolity will have poverty enough. It's time to start thinking about growing our own food, brethren. Having a garden. Getting prepared. By being prepared. Getting a gardens into production again. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, Solomon warns us in verse 12, The man also does not know his time. Like fish taken in a cruel net, like birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. Suddenly upon them. Proverbs, or Ecclesiastes rather, chapter 9, verse 12. I want to read that in the Amplified Bible. <coughs> Ecclesiastes 9, verse 12, Amplified Version. It says, For man also knows not his time of death. As the fishes are taken in an evil net, and as the birds are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when calamity falls suddenly upon them. The 
we are living in an evil time today, brethren. And it's time to take God's warnings seriously. So back in Luke chapter 21, again, in the Amplified Version, Christ tells us, But take heed to yourselves and be on your guard, lest your hearts be overburdened and depressed and weighed down with the giddiness and headache and nausea and self-indulgence drunkenness and worldly worries and cares pertaining to the business of this life. And lest that day come upon you suddenly like a trap or a noose. For it will come upon all who live upon the face of the entire earth. Keep awake then and watch at all times. Be discreet, attentive, and ready, praying that you may have the full strength and ability and be accounted worthy to escape all these things taken together that will take place and to stand in the presence of the Son of Man. Are you ready? Are you getting ready? Are you taking it lightly or soberly? Brethren, let's be wise men. And fear the Lord and depart from evil. And he will protect us.